from the Columbia University to give this uh, seminar today. Uh, I think you all have seen his brief CV, so I don't need to spend time introducing him. But I uh, just want to say that he's one of the uh, most internationally recognized Japanese economists and has extensive academic experience in many universities, uh, starting at the University of Minnesota, Hitosubashi University, University of Tokyo, and now um, Columbia University. And he is now, um, has been editor of the Asian Economic Policy Review, an economic journal, for the past 11 years, 12 years. He has not been privileged to have I've been an associate editor of this journal, so I've been working with Mr. Ito for a number of years. But he actually also had uh, experience as a policy maker. He was uh, the deputy vice minister for international affairs in the Ministry of Finance in, in uh, Tokyo. Uh, today, we'll talk about convergence and divergence, middle income traps in Asia, question mark. So, Professor Ito, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Salampo, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm very happy to be back here. Uh, I was trying to remember when the last time I was, uh, I was in this building, probably um, after the Asian crisis, that I was, I was almost commuting to Bangkok uh, for a couple of years. And uh, on one of those trips, I, I think I dropped by to give a seminar. And, um, um, Are you hoping to have so yeah, I, I was helping uh, uh, um, Tari, uh, finance minister uh, Tari, and uh, tried to, uh, Japan put up uh, four billion dollars along with IMF, four billion dollars, and so uh, the Japan wanted to to have some voice uh, uh, in be between the Thai government and IMF. So we we are try try to uh, be a um, uh, honest. Uh, Broker, honest uh, mediator uh, between IMF and, and, and uh, Thai government. So I was uh, I was uh, one of the team members uh, on that effort. So um, so mo most of the my academic work uh, since the Asian currency crisis was on the exchange rates and crisis and crisis management uh, uh, and so on. I, I I could have done that that kind of talk, but. I'm, I'm trying to now develop um, more uh, growth uh, uh, oriented story and um, um, this is still ongoing uh, work and I, I, I want um, uh, your input. Um, so um, um, the thesis is that um, there's a lot of discussions on the growth slowdown okay? and growth slowdown are uh, not only uh, emerging market economies, but also in the advanced countries. Um, and I, I know that there are voices of concern in uh, Malaysia, Thailand, and Korea, uh, Indonesia, that uh, those growth slowdown among emerging market economies uh, may take uh, emerging market economies to a stuck at the um, uh, middle income, or I would say upper middle income, uh, and not really reach the um, advanced country uh, uh, status. And I try to see whether, how, whether that, that argument uh, or hypothesis are valid or not. And also <clears throat> try to see whether this growth slowed down among the advanced countries and emerging market economies alike. Uh, temporary or uh, just a, a natural growth uh, convergence, or actually a trap, or in the worst case, uh, something called Japanization. And uh, I will try to uh, uh, define that. And um, uh, uh, depending on whether you know those uh, depending on the uh, factor or the slowdown, the policy prescriptions are different. Okay. So I'll start from the um, 
starting from um, the facts uh, of uh, Asia versus other regions and within the Asia uh, country by country, uh, try to look at the growth, um, uh, growth um, uh, experiences. And um, um, in this part of the world, it's, it's, there's no um, um, question that we understand that um, uh, Asia currency crisis um, was the biggest shock uh, uh, to, to the economy. But the other parts of the world, they're, they're talking about the global financial crisis of 2008-2009. And in the U.S. or Latin America, Europe, uh, they, they're still talking about the uh, global financial crisis and, and its, uh, its um, uh, aftermath, right? So first, that um, uh, uh, we, 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 we should remind ourselves and, and others that, yes, in, for Asia, uh, the Asian currency crisis was, it is, it is still the biggest shock to, 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 to uh, to current uh, present and um, um, try to so, sort of uh, see whether Asian uh, emerging market economies are different from other parts of the world. Uh, but still, <coughs> the recent growth uh, slowdown are also affecting the uh, Asian economies. And the question is that whether uh, Asian economies are losing momentum or is it just temporary? Okay. So first graph is to show that the except Asia, okay, except Asia, that global financial crisis was a big, big event that they had negative growth, and uh, although they, there was a, a V-shaped recovery, that since then, good growth slowdown is happening. For Asia, uh, Asian currency crisis, 97, 98, was the biggest dip in the growth uh, uh, rates, and global financial crisis was, yes, there was a, a slowdown, but not, not that much. But again, uh, in the last two, three years, there seems to be uh, a slightly uh, s slowdown, uh, even among Asian countries. But this emerging Asia uh, uh, include China, and the Ch Chinese weight is very large. So we need to differentiate among the Asian countries. And uh, this is a strange group, but uh, uh, Singapore, Korea, Hong Kong, which are which used to be called uh, four tigers, including uh, Taiwan, and uh, I added China and India. And so uh, Hong Kong, Korea, Singapore, yes, they had a big dip in the Asian currency crisis, and uh, the dip in. Uh, uh, global financial crisis, shallow war, uh, and uh, growth slowdown is, seems to be happening in the last three years. China didn't have any uh, significant uh, negative uh, effects. Uh, China and India uh, didn't have much of the effect from uh, Asian currency crisis in the 1978, um, and even in global financial crisis, yes, there was a dip in uh, uh, Chinese uh, growth rate. Uh, India was not uh, had a very different uh, movement, uh, but both India and China in the last uh, three years, that there seems to be slight uh, growth slow down. This is ASEAN, uh, ASEAN five. And uh, of course, the, uh, Indonesia was the uh, most uh, severely affected country during the 1998 uh, crisis, followed by Thailand, uh, Malaysia, and uh, uh, Singapore and Philippines were not that much affected. Global financial crisis, 2008-2009. Uh, well, the uh, Malaysia had negative growth, but others are uh, you know, zero growth, but uh, not that much affected. 
especially compared to the uh, Asian currency crisis, it was you know, milder, much, much milder. And um, um, again, it um, recovered um, uh, strongly, but in the last three years, there seems to be a growth uh, uh, slowed down. And Thailand is, uh, is uh, lowest uh, uh, among the uh, ASEAN five, and I'd like to hear uh, the explanation of that from this audience. The Philippines is an uh, interesting story. Philippines used to be the uh, uh, what we call laggard among the um, uh, ASEAN uh, five. Look at those 90s, uh, you know, 90s to 95. They are they are clearly the worst among the five. But look at the Philippines in the last three years. That they are the best among the five, uh, ASEAN five, and they are they are actually doing their, you know, they got their act together, okay? So these um, uh, differences among the SM5 are interesting stories. And uh, the Philippines, I, I would say, it's uh, mostly uh, political, that whether they had bad policies, bad um, uh, politics uh, in the 90s, and now they, they have uh, they have established uh, political stability and good good politics. Whether that carries over to the next uh, presidency is a big question. But so far, the last uh, uh, five since the global financial crisis, they are doing fantastically well, uh, relatively speaking. Um, so uh, you know this this again shows that the um, ASEAN five um, had shallower impact than the Asian currency crisis uh, in, in the uh, global financial crisis, but there seems to be a slowdown. Okay. Um, so this uh, slowdown in among the globe, um, advanced countries and emerging economies and even the Asian emerging economies, uh, there are several hypotheses. Okay. This, these are for um, advanced countries and the emerging economies uh, uh, com common, commonly applied to those, uh, uh, those countries. Okay, first uh, first um, um, hypothesis is this is just temporary. Okay. And um, uh, especially after the financial crisis, the effect seems to linger more than just the uh, real uh, shock uh, and so on. And this is more uh, in line with the um, uh, Rogoff um, Reinhardt's study that yes, financial crisis, after the financial, major financial crisis, the uh, 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 lower growth continues you know, five, seven years. And you know, we are just getting out of seven years uh, from uh, global financial crisis, so if the role of Reinhardt is right, then the uh, U.S. is getting out of uh, this seven-year uh, slow growth from the GFC and now getting you know, going, going back to normal. So this is the most optimistic uh, scenario. Uh, uh, it was just temporary, temporary like five, five seven years. Second explanation is that um, uh, this is especially for the emerging market economies that uh, this is um, uh, this is a um, uh, uh, natural process of growth convergence. So every so, so punctuation by crisis, that next phase is slower growth, but that's natural because we should expect that the um, the growth rate will be lower as income becomes higher. So this is what we call growth convergence. So we'll, we'll um, I'll, I'll explain in the next slide. And the third explanation is uh, middle income trap. That uh, there is something, uh, something uh, wrong or something uh, special about emerging, current emerging market economies that they cannot really catch up with the uh, OECD uh, level of the income 
and uh, there's a big debate on uh, what, what, what is this trap about. So um, this, is, this is something that, you know, um, that Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, and others should worry about. And the fourth explanation is more on the um, advanced economies. There, there's a lot of talk in, in US and Europe and, and Japan about um, uh, secular stagnation. There's, um, uh, this, the secular stagnation was um, rediscovered by the, the, the word, um, uh, technical term, is rediscovered by Larry Summers. But it was originally uh, uh, presented by Alvin Hansen. And the hypothesis is that, they, that uh, when, when there is a um, uh, lack of demand, um, then uh, natural real interest rate becomes negative. And it is very difficult that policy achieve the um, easing uh, uh, is, uh, uh, can achieve negative real interest rate. And that's why there's a long period of aggregate demand, uh, lack of aggregate demand, or the GDP gap uh, uh, stay wide uh, behind the aggregate supply. And that's the secular stagnation hypothesis. Okay, so there's a difficulty that policy could generate enough demand. Japanization is, uh, is a word sometimes heard um, now in Europe that they are worried about Japanization. What is Japanization? Japanization is a combination of secular stagnation and deflation. And once deflation happens, the uh, real interest rate is defined by nominal interest rate minus inflation rate. Right? So the inflation rate becomes negative then the real interest rate becomes positive. And nominal interest rate, there is a, a zero lower bound. So nominal interest rate is zero minus inflation rate, and inflation rate is negative, so real interest rate is positive. Okay, now I said secular stagnation is defined as negative natural real interest rate, which means that the real interest rate is always above natural interest, the real interest rate, and you cannot get out of uh, uh, you cannot get out of um, secular stagnation or the uh, big GDP gap, and that means that you have more deflation. So the more deflation means that deeper deflation means that higher in real interest rate, and you get worse and worse. Yeah, so this is the Japanization hypothesis, right? So this, so so the hypothesis C, middle income trap, is more on the emerging market economies. Secular stagnation, Japanization is more on the um, advanced uh, economies. But all of these are now presented and debated uh, in um, uh, major. Uh, economics uh, uh, fora uh, in, in, uh, in, in the world. Okay. Right. So, um, so th this is uh, this corresponds to this uh, B hypothesis B, right? So this is growth uh, convergence. This is in uh, uh, intermediate macro textbook or uh, growth. Theory uh, uh, textbook, and uh, follows from uh, classical uh, solo type uh, growth model, or uh, even the new new growth model uh, in uh, uh, in uh, uh, Paul Roma and uh, Ace Moguru uh, type of uh, uh, growth theory. It's it's common in the old and new growth theory. So growth convergence says that as the per capita income becomes higher, the growth rate of per capita income becomes lower. Okay. Or starting point is that if you have the per capita income is low, then growth rate is 
high. Okay, so you travel, growth rate is high means you travel to the right. So you naturally follow this uh, uh, slope and going, going from upper left to lo lower right. Okay. So high growth, low income, to high income, low growth. You travel along this slope. Japan did it from 1950s, 60s, and 70s, travel from uh, upper left to lower right. First, uh, experiencing 10% growth rate. Uh, well, in the per capita, if you translate it per, per capita, it was 9%, uh, but uh, you had a, a they, they, uh, Japan had a growth, uh, uh, sorry, the demographic dividend in the uh, 50s, 60s. So, uh, but anyway, 9% growth to 4% growth to 1% growth, but income rose uh, from, uh, from so, so emerging market level to the advanced level in uh, 40 years uh, uh, development. Followed by Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore in the 70s, 80s. They traveled from upper left to lower right. And uh, ASEAN countries uh, uh, traveled from upper left to sort of middle of this uh, uh, slope. Okay. So this is sort of a global uh, 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 textbook explanation how the growth rate would change over time. Okay. The exception is um, Africa, which is stuck at the lower income level, and they never have high growth. So they, they, they are um, so, sort of a, a, what we call a, in a very old development theory, uh, the uh, poverty trap. Okay. So poverty trap is that you, you are so poor that you cannot have any you know, kickstart of the uh, high growth. In Asia, something happened, some fortunate mix of the um, growth that uh, low-income Asian country tends to have high growth rate and you travel through this growth convergence line. Africa never had it. Latin America, it's a different story. It's uh, going backwards. And so, but um, um, that, that's a different story. Let's concentrate on Asia. So Asia, Asian countries, we are the textbook growth convergence uh, 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 region. Okay, so uh, um, the um, growth um, economists love Asians. Yeah, that is uh, text textbook applies. Right. So um, uh, so I already mentioned that Japan and four tigers, followed by China and ASEAN. Four, uh, because Singapore is part of the uh, Tigers. And now CLMV and India uh, started this high high growth uh, path. Okay. So if this is true, then uh, you know growth slow down for emerging market economies are natural. And uh, you don't have to worry about it. Or if you try to promote too, much, too high growth by policies, maybe you, you may end up in a bubble or you may end up in hyperinflation. So uh, don't worry too much about it. That's the sort of growth convergence uh, theory and hypothesis. But people worry, people in Southeast Asia worry about middle income trap. Okay? So what is middle income trap? That's the next question. Right? Uh, all right, so I tried to sort of show visually what this growth convergence uh, looked like. So basically, um, the, 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 the vertical axis is the growth rate, but not growth rate year by year. I take the periods of five to ten years and calculate average growth rate of, of the period. Horizontal axis, I take the uh, income per capita, GDP per capita, as 
standardized in uh, US dollars, so you can compare uh, country by country. So this is a this is level, so um, uh, you have to normalize uh, uh, to, to the um, uh, common currency that I do it in US dollars. Many other people use the the um, PPP exchange rate, which is uh, calculated by World Bank and uh, used to be called the PEM table, but uh, now it's a uh, World Bank. Um, I don't trust their uh, PPP exchange rates, uh, so uh, I use the uh, market rate. So there, there's pros and cons on, on using market rate or the um, uh, PPP exchange rate. I take the market rate and take the first year of the this period uh, growth rate. The reason is that you have the initial position and the initial position is low income, then you can expect high growth for the next five to 10 years. So to draw this graph, uh, the horizontal axis is the uh, income level of the first year of this period average, and growth rate is a period average, a compounding rate of, of the uh, five years or 10 years. Uh, and I punctuate, I define this periods as the in between the crisis, okay. So before the Asian crisis, Asian currency crisis, between Asian crisis and global crisis, and after the global crisis, after the global financial crisis, there is uh, only few, you know, several uh, data points. But the, um, uh, so so the um, period periods um, are uh, not the same uh, for for this exercise. I, I, Later, I can do uh, the different exercise. So first, first period before the Asian currency crisis, ten years between the um, uh, between the um, uh, two crises, it's uh, eight years, and and after the crisis, it's five years. I deliberately uh, uh, delete the crisis years like this, 97, 98, or 08, 09, because I do not want those crises years to, uh, to uh, influence the period average. So I, I compare normal periods of the uh, th three, three different periods. Okay, so this is, this is what I, I did. You, you, if you want to replicate it, you can, you can do uh, different kinds of uh, combinations, including crisis years or diff you know, different uh, period average for different countries or PPP exchange rate rather than uh, market exchange rate. There are many ways to cut this, but the point is try to get this growth convergence, uh, growth convergence uh, 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 table. Okay. So this is what I got, right? So um, this is the uh, horizontal axis is is the uh, uh, US dollar uh, 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 per capita income logarithm, okay? And um, uh, the vertical axis is uh, growth rates, okay? So it's a bit difficult to look, but uh, here is uh, Japan, Korea, and Singapore around here. Thailand and China is uh, moving very fast to uh, left to right, yeah, the income is rising. Growth rate is slow, slowing down a little bit, and um, um, and um, uh, th this is Cambodia. <laughs> Cambodia is moving very fast, but um, the others, uh, in, uh, Thailand, Malaysia is around here. The CNMB, including uh, Cambodia, um, it's it's growing from here and um, uh, moving, moving to right, uh, so uh, all of them are growing. Um, especially after the Asian cr cr currency crisis. Um, before the Asian currency crisis, CLMB uh, data, I cannot trust them. So uh, uh, for the CLMB, I think only after Asian crisis, we, we, it's, a, it's a meaningful uh, data. Um, and um, um, the, the, by the way, this is Brunei. Uh, it's a commodity based.
basic armies and, and it's not really fit to uh, growth, uh, growth uh, convergence story. So uh, uh, you have to ignore the name for, for this uh, uh, kind of work. All right, so um, this is one graph. Another graph um, is, oops, so, okay, so this is in ratio to US. So the world is, is, um, an, uh, uh, is advancing uh, all the time with innovation, right? So um, uh, yes, Asia is growing, but the point is whether you catch up with the advanced economies, right? Because advanced economies' income is growing all the time, so the, your target of the high income is uh, moving right constantly, right? So the previous graph ignores that fact that the uh, edge of the innovation is moving right all the time. So this graph, I took the ratio to U.S. So suppose U.S. is the, the highest uh, uh, income, uh, most advanced in innovation. And uh, then uh, what are you catch up to U.S.? You, uh, it is, is a, a growth challenge of the growth or the test of the growth convergence, then uh, it's, it's, um, uh, it's, uh, it's correct, it's um, more appropriate to take the ratio to US and, and, and log of that, okay. So it's now, it's a little bit more widely uh, uh, distributed because you, you take the ratio to, 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 uh, to the US. So, um, Again, uh, Japan uh, is more um, converged to the U.S. Korea is catching up. China is in the halfway. ASEAN around here. CLMB around here. Right. Now, is it? Can we say that we have one line to converge to the to the U.S. or maybe not? Right. So, looks like there are currently three groups or three convergence lines. This is one convergence line to US, and this is sort of the second convergence line, and there's a third convergence line. And uh, some countries jump from the uh, one convergence line to the other. China seems to be you know, moving to the most advanced uh, convergence line, the starting point of the uh, high income. But there seems to be that there are some countries which are not really making to the uh, most advanced convergence line. And uh, there, there may be still the low uh, convergence line, but some of them try to get to the middle convergence line. The point is that point is that maybe we have three different convergence lines and uh, somehow you have to jump from the middle income convergence line to the high income convergence line. Otherwise you sort of, you slope towards the uh, middle income convergence line and you end up around here rather than jump to the high, high growth and um, uh, there. So what is the what is the difference? So this is sort of my idea of the middle income trap, that you, you are not hopping to the uh, advanced economy growth convergence line, but you are on different growth convergence. You are growth convergence doing, you, you are doing growth convergence, but the convergence line is different from um, high income convergence line. So uh, this is my sort of explanation of middle income trap, that you are converging, but not to the uh, truly high income uh, uh, convergence. You slow down too early. You slow down while you are still uh, middle income. That's what uh, middle income trap 
is about. Okay. So um, again, still, still, this, this is not widely accepted uh, uh, way of explanation. This is my way of explanation. Um, okay. So what is the uh, what is the difference between those middle income convergence and high income convergence, right? So this is according to the growth theory, and uh, uh, where, where you end up, uh, the which growth convergence you are on depends on how fast the uh, how fast the TFP basically how fast the innovation uh, is, is occurring. So you need to you know, what you what you know you, you you make a jump from the middle convergence to a high convergence is the probable difference in innovation TFP growth, which is the uh, which is the um, the uh, technological progress, which is probably uh, based on the human capital development uh, and, and and so on. So um, you know, I'm I'm getting more and more into the uh, speculative hypothesis um, uh, statement, but the um, um, uh, that that is uh, uh, that uh, that is my way of explaining middle income trap and how, how to get out of it, uh, get out, getting out. And going into a high convergence means that uh, you have to have that human capital investment and uh, uh, and uh, promote innovation. Okay, so that's the uh, middle income trap story. And uh, let me explain on uh, sort of my my way of uh, explaining secular stagnation and uh, Japanization. So this is more on U.S. Europe. Uh, Japan and Korea is now worried about the Japanization very much. So um, uh, I, I, I went to Korea. I went to Seoul uh, last week and I had a discussion. And they're, they're really worried about Japanization. All right. So um, um, so secular stagnation means this. This is again my. Um, uh, my way of um, uh, defining things, and this is not uh, this is not universally accepted yet. Uh, but stagnation means that um, our growth rate is uh, uh, lower than um, uh, potential growth rate. <coughs> Secular stagnation means that uh, this the stagnation continues uh, for a long time, not m many years. And this, that happens because the natural growth rate, no, sorry, natural real interest rate is below zero, and actual uh, actual uh, real interest rate is above natural real interest rate. Uh, zero lower bound of nominal interest rate uh, is um, uh, is happening when the monetary policy is to uh, with conventional. Tool to the maximum. Suppose you have deflation, which is negative inflation rate, then uh, uh, you have the secular stagnation uh, uh, always because your uh, real interest rate is positive, as I explained. So, Japanization is all of the, all of the above, and um, uh, you get stuck. In the secular stagnation and deflation uh, uh, for long, long time. So in Japan, <clears throat> Japan experienced deflation, which is negative inflation rate, for 15 years, 1998 to 2012. And with the in the last three years, the inflation rate is now in the positive territory, but. Um, uh, uh, the 15 years of deflation, and probably that meant uh, 15 years of uh, 15 years of stagnation. Uh, it was uh, was uh, was uh, very costly to Japanese uh, standard living and, and per capita income, and, and and so on. So, the Mr. Abe, the current Prime Minister, realized that. Uh, and uh, uh, when he took the prime ministership for the second time, uh, 
uh, first time was the first time, but the second time that he, he made the right call that uh, Bank of Japan has to change and, um, uh, and um, uh, adopt the uh, commercial easing and, um, and so on. So the last three years, it's, you know, Japan is getting out of this Japanese uh, state, not completely, but um, uh, gradually. Okay, so um, uh, let's see what are, how, how the advanced countries are doing. Okay. So this is, um, I did, um, I did uh, with mechanical period definition. Uh, I didn't, uh, I used all the data. Uh, I did not uh, take out crisis years. <coughs> so, uh, so different, uh, different words cutting things. But the, um, this is uh, how the growth rates, so this is, sorry, this is not growth convergence graph. This is growth rates of the period average, okay? So, um, although it's uh, down sloping, this is not growth convergence because horizontal axis is, uh, is a period, not the per capita income. Okay, so, um, well, th this is fi five, um, five countries, or the euro area uh, is, uh, uh, is, um, uh, is a, is a Area average and Germany is one of them. So this is not re uh, Germany and the Euro area are closely related, but um, at least four countries or four four countries plus one one region. Um, it's slow, slow down or the growth rate coming down is common and very uh, it's co moving uh, uh, of of the advanced countries. Uh, so so first thing is that this. Stagnate, secular stagnation is um, only you know, talked about, de de debated in the last uh, uh, four or five years, but it's a long-run phenomenon. It started in 1990 or um, even 85 that growth slowdown has happened. Okay, so it's not global financial crisis which made the advanced countries to slow down. It has been going on for uh, at least two, two decades or more, first point. Second, that short-term nominal interest rate has been coming down again since 1985-1990. Japan is an outlier in the sense that it became zero in 2000. So zero nominal lower bound is uh, is uh, uh, binding in Japan since 2000. Okay, but look, you know, other countries has reached zero. You know, the Japanese on the verge of Japanization uh, recently. So after the global financial crisis, what is new is that nominal interest rate has become zero. Okay, so uh, they, they, they now, in a sense, converge to Japan, unfortunately. Okay, so this is long-term nominal interest rate, and um, uh, it is, um, uh, uh, sorry, the title is wrong. This is real interest rate. Okay. The title is wrong, sorry, this is real. So this is correct, short-term real interest rate. And um, um, I don't know why I put uh, so this is short-term real interest rate. So um, the policy rate minus inflation rate. It's all um, uh, uh, negative, uh, except Japan, right? Japan, you cannot go to negative because inflation rate is, uh, uh, is negative, right? So um, uh, they all go to negative to stimulate the economy. Okay, Japan cannot stream the economy because it's in deflation. Okay, again, sorry, this is wrong. This is uh, this is right. Okay, so I made up two graphs. Okay, so this is long real. This is long real, and uh, it's converged to zero, but not yet uh, negative. And uh, this is the inflation rate, showing that Japan only Japan had deflation. Okay, it's slightly. Out the deflation. 
Okay, so last, uh, uh, lastly, let's touch on the policy pres prescription. Um, so first, mention if it's temporary, then uh, uh, you you can you can wait uh, or just do counter scope policy. But as I showed you, um, it seems to be long, long, long run phenomena that growth, growth uh, slowdown has happened. It's the last. 20 years phenomena. So it may not be just temporary. Growth convergence, uh, if that's the case, then do nothing. But uh, for advanced countries, again, uh, uh, it's getting lower and lower too. And I'm not sure that this is a sufficient explanation, or especially politicians wouldn't buy it. Middle income trap, uh, if that's the case, then human capital is important, uh, education, and investment, which stimulates the uh, innovation, is important. And export, um, of course, helps. If it's a Japanization, then uh, uh, aggressive uh, QE to avoid deflation is needed, which Japan belated applied in the last three years. And um, you need to increase population. Uh, uh, you need a kick from uh, demography or avoid the demographic uh, uh, deficits. Okay, so um, Asia is still a center of growth compared to the other regions, uh, but uh, uh, there seems to be a uh, uh, growth uh, slowdown. And uh, some parts of it is growth convergence. The middle income uh, countries are uh, converging to you know, high income group, but um, there, there seems to be uh, uh, not enough to get to the high income uh, uh, group, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, called mid middle income trap. So maybe a more aggressive uh, policy uh, is needed for the emerging market economies, for the innovation, and for Japan and uh, Europe uh, to avoid uh, uh, deflation. So that's all I wanted to say. And thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. For this <coughs> so this um, presentation has looked at the growth patterns of a number of countries. And it seems to be striking, at least from the pictures that were shown, that there could, have, there could be three different convergence paths. Um, if we go to the successful country, then the convergence part would lead them to to advance economic status or uh, close to the level of U.S. income. Um, for others, uh, one could not converge. <laughs> that is, you follow a path where uh, even before you get anywhere near to advance economic status, the growth rate slows down substantially. Therefore, you are stuck somewhere in the middle, and of course, there could be a path where um, you start at a level of almost poverty and really not grow at all. Um, so, in the case of Thailand, obviously, we don't want to be stuck, <laughs> but whether you know we can go on to the high conversion path, or indeed whether any of these different different paths exist or not, that's something to to discuss. Um, so what I'd like to do is just to open up the floor to co comments or questions that you might have that we can discuss uh, the issues that are raised. Dr. Sonkir. Professor Ito, I would like to um, take a look at your uh, slide um, number 14 on the three uh, convergence paths. Um, yeah, this, this is the one. Um, I think the interpretation that um, the middle income trap is the um, inability to shift from one convergence path to another one is rather problematic. Um, in my opinion, um, the, the path, um, if the paths are really parallel as you draw in this picture, it means that if we assume that the endowment or the initial condition of the, each country is the same, the only thing is different is the TFP. Um, but then, um, if that's the case, um, it is not the 
uh, if if that's the case, the middle income trap is something only that um, you start late and you cannot converge because um, the world has changed, um, which makes um, it's impossible for you to go long enough in the future. Um, I think the case of China that you mentioned that um, is the one who move from the which moves from the middle path to the high income path um, should be independent in the way that it has different slope, flatter slope rather than uh, the same slope but on jump from one path to another path. Um, okay. Also, let me just find out the case of the Philippines. It was quite interesting. Because they're this is the they're stuck at the bottom, um, and then because of recent good performance, it somehow has jumped onto the middle part. Um, so the thing is that these are not automatic paths, obviously. Yeah. So why is it that the Philippines can make the transition you know, from the low to the middle, and even if a country like Thailand is now seems to be following the middle path, but why can't we then make a jump? So you know, what, what is, would be the reasons that would allow countries to make that particular jump? Yeah, so uh, Thailand is, is the red, red cross. So yeah, this is Thailand, and, and this is a this is a middle income trap um, thing. Uh, Philippines is a low uh, income trap, is now moving up towards the uh, middle income convergence line. So Philippines is now uh, like uh, Thailand uh, 20 years ago, or 10 years ago, uh, 20 years ago, right? So uh, if I'm lucky, then the Philippines go to, to this path. But Thailand um, and um, Malaysia, they have to move to the high income convergence. Um, okay. So that's the, that's a, uh, then why, right? So uh, um, uh, why? Well, Philippines, I, I mentioned that uh, it was um, a sort of political uh, instability, political uh, system which held their growth rate um, uh, uh, are naturally low. So they had a potential to have the high high growth rate uh, given their low income status, but they couldn't have the high income because of the um, political situation. So, um, uh, but probably lack of innovation too. And so, um, um, still, I'm developing the um, uh, ideas uh, and, and so on. So uh, obvious, obvious candidate is uh, innovation, which is uh, education and uh, universities. And uh, another factor, obvious factor, is political stability. And um, uh, that sort of the, that influenced the, um, uh, also the innovation. So let's, let's okay, I'll have any questions. I like this three lines. Um, you like it? Yes. You like this? Thank you. <laughs> it, it appears to me, my interpretation is this, uh, to, to move along the lines is in some sense easy, natural. It's a, entirely an economic mechanism. But to jump from one line to another requires an effort. Uh, an effort which is primarily political. You have the, the society has to make an effort to accept new rules of the game, new methods of doing things, new relationships. <coughs> Way back in 58, I think Thailand made a decision to jump from the first line to the second line. Uh, uh, 1958 is, is the key day. 
conservative macro policy, we spend a lot of uh, money on infrastructure, etc., etc. Um, education was invested in, and the education at that time was basically moving from primary to secondary education, universal secondary education, etc. Once having made all those decisions, we just we just coast along the curve. In fact, we coast along below the curve. So the effort is not hard. But to jump from that to the next step is hard. What is needed now is not investment in education in money terms. I think TDRI has shown that we are investing a lot on education, except that the Thing that needs to be is reform, institutional reform, to get a consensus of the country as to what kind of reform is needed, how to move the Ministry of Education away from education, and how to a lot of a lot of hard decisions, uh, encouraging innovation. That's very hard. And I think there is also the diversion created by the taxing era that because the economy needs stimulus, we have, since uh, 97, we have been using stimulus to promote private consumption a lot at the expense of investment. Investment has been stuck at a level of about 30 percent, less than 30 percent, 25 percent of the entire post. And moving from that to a much higher level of investment, as particularly in the private sector, and there's a distributional problem, is that the private sector has been happy to expand its operations, largely by importing labor, importing cheap labor. We never move away from the cheap labor policy that was the case during the, the second line. We need to move to a more consciously pro-high wage a high wage path where, and not only high wage, but where the private firms plan its future based on a growing wage rate, which means a different kind of policy, a different kind of distribution of emphasis, etc. All of this. All of this is hard, it's not easy. And so it's, the Thailand is a lucky country. The easy path 
are being stuck in the second round that worked quite well for us. And it became easy. And to move from the second part. So I think this model shows that the work of moving from the second line to the third line is not simple Washington consensus kind of set formula. You really have to work hard at it. You have to really do the political work. Okay. That's why I don't know what is cause and effect, but our political problems may be a consequence of the effort to move, or it may be the cause of why we are not able to move, to jump to the third, uh, third line. That's, that's my reading. Uh, and I think this is very illuminating to me. Uh, I don't know. Uh, in general, I like, I like this model. But the, what is not here, it is very economic, concentrated view. Uh, when you are doing, moving from one line to another, you are talking about a qualitative change in the economy. Using a model with the fixed parameters and so on will carry you that far. Will carry you. So in some sense, behind each line, I believe you have, uh, you can devise an economic model, pure economic model, uh, growth model. Okay, with fixed parameters. Uh, to move from one line to another, you have to change those parameters. And how, how easy and how difficult that is will depend on each country. Uh, the Philippines case is, is an interesting one. Uh, I wish I knew more about the Phil I used to know a bit about the, uh, I think, uh, they, they, I think they're still basically hovering around the second line. Uh, they haven't got to face what, our problems yet. But I think they have to complete the transition to the second line. And many more or less, they've completed that. Once, once you get the set formula of the second line, uh, the, the future is easy. As long as you don't, you don't, I mean, we have done that. I think mean, we have pleased foreign investors much more than we should, but that's and that's another thing now. Because we have depended largely, particularly after ninety seven, uh, we have depended largely on foreign investment to get out of that hole uh, until our entire our manufacturing sector, particularly the export sector is uh, dominated by multinationals. So the innovative path is not taken by domestic capabilities, but is largely imported through the multinationals. Uh, with the multinationals, uh, you can't trust them to stick around. Uh, only the Japanese, fact, less than, seems to have stuck around. I'm talking this so because far. of the part. So far. Uh, but even they uh, may be getting fed up. But it's, uh, I think the, that's, in a sense, if you want to critique the Washington consensus, we will be a poster child for that too. It's, we have had life too easy. The growth has been too easy. It helps because we were a land surplus country. So we don't have the food problem that plagued the Indians and the Philippines. Uh, that's the one exception that makes the second line an easy coast for us. Thank you very much. I, um, I like that you like uh, the three lines. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I. Um, 
what you said um, all makes sense, and I, I think I steal your ideas and, and expand my uh, my, uh, my my research. Um, the um, um, I fully agree that the jump is a qualitative one, and uh, you know I have to bring in uh, more than economics, like you know, political uh, uh, decision, and almost like revolution. Um, and in Ch Chinese case, you know, there has been a ten sharp in shock, uh, 1978. And the 1994 reform of um, uh, unified exchange rates um, uh, and opening up uh, for the uh, uh, FDI and so on. So, you know, it, for Drova, uh, I should go into each country and dates all those um, uh, 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 political decisions which made possible to jump from first line to second line and possibly second line to third line. And, uh, that, that may be uh, um, that may be good. I have to write uh, three volumes set of the. Uh, <laughs> uh, since you mentioned China, I think China and India are uh, interested in the sense that uh, the shock that can come from jumping from one line to another can be concentrated in different parts of the country. And that means a cost to the society will be localized. Will be both localized and will also uh, be spread out over time. So let's say the inland part of China will have to will first action will be migrate and, and they don't have to I mean, their shock is the, the cost of migration. Uh, I, mean, I think there is an interesting story to be told about China and I believe one day India. China China. I think the point I'm interested in this chart is that uh, all the three have, have very similar slope. Um, uh, the 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 rightmost one would be fine because ev then if everyone eventually converged to to the front tree, the frontier. So even if uh, I'm uh, Taiwan or I'm Korea or I'm Singapore, okay. Even if my growth drops significantly. But the problem seems to be that the, the second one has the same slope as the third one. And in the context of Thailand, I'm not sure whether that, I can interpret that uh, the, the, uh, uh, Thailand has the same slope as Korea or Singapore in this chart is because we follow the same footsteps. Uh, and then we just start off from uh, a much poorer point. And if we, we follow exact the footstep exactly the same way the Singapore and Korea uh, did, we will never get to uh, where we want to be anyway. So if that's the case, then uh, what we are observing today is that there are a lot of talks about uh, uh, the disappearing global trade in goods. So even if the large countries recover very well, uh, but global trade in goods uh, never pick up. And uh, it seems to me that the, the growth model in the past 10 or 20 years have been that countries in the developing world ride the growth rate of global trade uh, in order to pick themselves up. And if it is true that this trend is no longer the case, uh, maybe for the next 10 years, uh, uh, growth in, in, in goods trade across the, the world will never pick up. Uh, then if we continue to follow this uh, model, we will never get anywhere. So it might be the case, as others have said, that we may have to change the model or we need some kind of shock. So I guess my, 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 my point is that um, uh, I'm not sure whether this is 
this uh, this convergence is is the the mirror image of what has been driving global growth in the last 20 years, uh, which is manufacturing. And if the next 10 to 20 years is not manufacturing, then maybe uh, China or Philippines or some other countries that are not heavily invested in manufacturing like us will fare a better chance at converging to a better, a better stage. Uh, related to this, can I just uh, maybe uh, ask Taka to take a look further? Um, if you take away small countries, Singapore, Hong Kong, they're just city states, so they should not really be part of this in Brunei. And one could argue actually that uh, at the top line, there's one path. If you just take China, South Korea, Japan, it's a kind of path that is, the slope will be a little bit less than your current right hand side. But it basically follows a path that will converge relatively quickly to the high income level. And then you have another group of countries, including Thailand, Philippines, that instead of having this line, the two lines there with the same slope as the top one, maybe there should be only one line. But the line should have a um, the slope should be less, but it can converge to the high income level, but it takes a very long time. Okay, so this gets away from having any kind of middle income trap. But simply that somehow countries in ASEAN particularly are not following the high, the, the rapid convergence of the top line. But it can still converge. But it will take 40 years rather than 50 years, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, there's something you, know, you might want to explore. Actually, my original point is really similar to Dr. Chalong um, point. I, I think the slope should not be the same uh, in the three regime. The three regime is okay, but um, the, the slope should be different. And I think um, you should um, probably think about um, deriving a theoretical model to derive the, the meaning of slope. Is it the TFP or is it something else? Um, I, I haven't uh, developed the theory yet. Um, um, my, the growth theory, the solo or, uh, or newer ones, um, would say TFP because everything is thrown into TFP in growth theory. Uh, more the um, <clears throat> new growth theory, they, they, they put in more factors like education or religion or um, other things. Um, and um, <clears throat> and um, um, so, um, yeah, if the production functions are different, then uh, you, you, could, you could support two, uh, two convergence lines instead of. Two, two lines that requires uh, jumps. Um, um, yes, yeah, so I, I, I will explore those things in two, two different ways of looking at uh, the same graph. Um, other, another thing you, you mentioned it's uh, Singapore and Hong Kong are just small, small city states, and, and I agree. Uh, uh, another Important factors which I haven't um, um, I haven't um, uh, explored, except uh, just you know, one one word. That's the last line is the um, uh, population and population size of population. And you know, Dr. Amar will remember that uh, we, we used to think that uh, large population is a disadvantage for economic growth that goes back to Kunda Uh And that, that's why China and India uh, never uh, take off. That was the you know, thinking of the 1950s. And uh, many people are too young to remember 1950s. <laughs> Not quite yet. <laughs> um, but that, that was thinking, actually. And, and um, uh, only recently, that uh, these uh, large populations good thing. That means uh, large, uh, large domestic markets and, and you know companies are interested in coming 
uh, coming in and, and establish uh, uh, factories near the consumers. And uh, so that that is also, so how to get the FDI to come and uh, population, domestic markets um, um, have something to do with it. Um, then uh, uh, that, that may be a different, uh, another factor that may, may explain or may not explain high, convert, high, high growth convergence or low speed convergence. Uh, whether the endpoint is the same or not, that's, the, uh, that's another issue. Uh, that's another. Since I belong to the primary older generation, I also got my first education in development economics, which they called in the, in the late 50s. Uh, uh, I was stuck with that. But I think it's not just a large population per se, it's large population in relation. India and China are both densely populated large countries. Okay, uh, the United States, after all, is also a large population. It's, it's, so when you have that, you have the law of diminishing returns working very strongly against growth. Um, because of many factors, uh, it's, and that was when there was not much TFP in agriculture and food production. And that's why densely populated countries are this disadvantage. China being particularly densely populated, as is India. So it's, uh, now that we have got over the hump of agriculture. Certainly China has, uh, and India is following. Uh, there's only economies of scale to be had from a large country. And you can see that in, term, in terms of technology, technological development. Most countries are much more technologically independent. All the literature that talks about that, that I read about Thailand problem with the middle income trap is that we are we are at risk because we are not technologically independent enough. We haven't got our own capacity to develop technology. And that's why I said because we have had it too easy. It's inviting that the yeah, and and we have we have FDI, and, 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 and you you don't steal technology from those in, in multinationals. <laughs> You're too honest. Uh, <laughs> actually. No, we we try to, and I think the only sector where the Americans particularly are concerned about because of their technology, uh, because of their political prowess is uh, pharmaceutical. Yeah. And we were stopped short. We were on the path to doing that. Uh, and there was, there was a period in the early 90s when the Americans tried very hard to stop the Indians yeah. from developing that. They did the same in Thailand. We out to the Americans, but the Indians said no. And that's why the Indian now have quite a respectable pharmaceutical industry. And all these very high tech, high sophistication industries, which is where the third part, the third line is all about. Okay. The Indians are well into that. And also with a lot of intellectual property. And that we have given in much too much to the American. TPP is bad. Well, the, the only thing I'm afraid about TPP is nowadays most tech would be 
is about intellectual property. I'm particularly concerned about the pharmaceutical company. Before we turn there, just to add, there's still our technology. You know, Zero Charge Force? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the biggest seller now in the US, which originated from the town of Zero Charge in the Eastern Seaboard. So we never actually patterned that name. So now it's being sold, you know, and make a lot of money in the US by. Vietnamese company. <laughs> Halo Bay Sauce. Mm -hmm. Become Halo Bay Sauce? No, it's called still Sierra Sauce. We don't use geographical indication? No, no, we didn't register. We didn't, you know, pattern. No, 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 pattern. Trademark and trademark. Trademark and GRT. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question about the Halo Bay Sauce? Mm -hmm. In your policy prescription, mentioned from A to D, and whether you should do nothing or you would invest in human capital, or in case of Japanization, it's mainly about monetary policy. But I wonder whether the performance of an economy, the growth rate, or whether it, it's really an interplay between microeconomics and macroeconomics policies, and whether one can really disaggregate that this is microeconomic problems, TFPs, basically microeconomics, from what is essentially macroeconomics. Um, for example, I wonder whether Japanization is purely a monetary factor, or is it, does it include you know, uh, structural reform of the country as well? Yeah, 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 good point. Yeah, I didn't mean to differentiate micro and macro and, and identify uh, to each uh, uh, problem. And Japanization is obviously uh, related to um, um, micro structure reform issues. But getting out of deflation is mostly monetary policy. So uh, after that, whether to, to you know, even within the, I think, the high growth path, you know, there's, uh, I think Japan is actually going back well, um, that um, uh, to get back on the um, uh, high growth path, the um, uh, Japanese uh, structure reform and um, innovation. So um, um, I, I didn't mean that each country has only macro and micro. A good point. Do you believe that the Japanese model of growth at the time was largely based on the trade sector? Manufacturing growth and manufacture. Yes, so Japan, Korea, and Four Tigers, um, uh, it's, it's a, and to some extent, China is a success story of the exports and success story of the uh, export-oriented manufacturing growth. And um, I think we documented quite well in the uh, uh, Asia miracle of, uh, of the World Bank study in 1994. And, um, uh, but nowadays it's more complicated as, uh, as uh, service sector is more important and innovation comes from the uh, service sector. So um, uh, that 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 sort of the let's say flying geese um, uh, you you and I remember those uh, flying geese um, uh, that flying geese uh, export oriented uh, manufacturing that is probably um, uh, losing the relevance in the growth uh, uh, convergence or growth um, experience story and uh, maybe we we need to move on to a uh, different so sub-sector oriented I think, I, I think that, for example, your hotel retail trade sector in Japan mm -hmm. is not particularly world class. I disagree. So uh, <laughs> that's... <laughs> Wow, class. No, 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 no. That's uh, that's OECD um, uh, misconception of the service, service sector of Japan. The no, service, I, I the retail, retail in Japan, 
Have you been to Tokyo recently? <laughs> no, I, I can see one thing. Yeah. The quality of service in Japan for a developed country yeah. is very good. Yes. Uniquely very good. That's world class. It's the quality. <laughs> yeah. But it also implies that it's, it's, it's expensive. It's not that you know, you don't no. Not now. So this product swapped into this market. But you have to have the game going around to make it work. No, no, the retail has many sectors, right? Yeah. I, would, I would say the convenience store in Japan is a world class, and it's well, we are exporting to 7-Eleven. Uh, uh, you, you have to import your 7-Eleven. Yeah. I was told The old style department store is declining. Yeah. Um, hotels, I think they're undergoing a significant uh, change or innovations. Um, I think the hotels here is much better than hotels in Tokyo. Yeah. Attack, can I ask yeah. you something? Sure. In the case of Japan, yeah. one would probably say that Japan was already an advanced economy before Second World War. Yeah. Because it's really highly industrialized. Right. And at that time, it was not trade that really lifted Japan's in terms of. So what, what would be the reason behind Japan's rise to advanced economy? Yeah, so, so um, uh, in, in the Japanese economic history, there is a um, uh, there is a hypothesis that Japan was uh, already advanced economies in, in the pre-war sense, one of the five uh, uh, top uh, uh, countries um, um, in the League of Nations, um, and lost um, almost everything, lost two thirds of the productive capacity in uh, uh, in the war and. So it was, it was easy, in a sense, to catch up to the pre-war level, or the pre-war sort of trend line. But that, that was reached around 1960. And from 70s and 80s, it was beyond what pre-war trend was uh, suggesting. So it, it did more than just catch up to the uh, uh, pre-war level. Uh, they were, uh, the Japanese don't have to waste I really like that you really like my three line story. <laughs> so, Mr. As, as I mentioned before, if you bend it and slow, I would yeah. like your, your three teams as well. Okay, so I, I, um, I will. Two line. Two line. Okay. <laughs> I, will, I will try. I will try that. No, too. but I, I will disagree with you. <laughs> No, no, uh, that's, that's not, not, not my proposal. My proposal uh, is that the slope is not the same. Otherwise, you have difficulties interpreting it because every country has the same GFP, which is not true. No. no. But what is behind Professor Ito's suggestion of the is because countries like Thailand, Malaysia, the Philippines, uh, belong at any given time belong to the same set of constraints and capabilities. Uh, uh, at any given time, in other words, and we also happen to industrialize more or less simultaneously, even the Philippines. Uh, the Philippines were the but China and Japan, at the time they industrialized, i.e. now and Japan in the 60s and 70s, they were, they were very different in terms of preparation. Because the Japanese institutional structure and so on was designed for an industrialized country from, the world, from about 1950. They recovered from the war. 
ยังมีภาพโดยเฉพาะยิ่งที่เรียวเขาเป็นชาวการ์ดของจีนเพราะเขาถูกบอมบ์ในสมิดเดิลส์บนดินแดนในดินแดนเมื่อเด็กคนนี้เขาเป็นคนที่มีความสามารถมากกว่าคนอื่นที่มีความสามารถมากกว่าคนอื่นที่มีความสามารถมากกว่าคนอื่นที่มีความสามารถมากกว่าคนอื่นที่มีความสามารถมากกว่าคนอื่นที่มีความสามารถมากกว่าคนอื่นที่มีความสามารถมากกว่าคนอื่นที่มีความสามารถมากกว่าคนอื่นที่ Much faster. Mm -hmm. So also a creative destruction. But anyway, we would love to. Do you have any more questions? Comments? Well, we need uh, voices from young generation. Yes, young generation. Okay, I can talk to you now. <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you so much for this ito. This was also very enlightening, and and um, I, I think I sort of agree with um, with the Dr. Somkia that maybe the slopes you know would be different for countries with different initial starting points. So um, that was one of the things, and um, I think I have two questions actually. The first one is I'm, I'm quite interested in the path for. Um, Malaysia and Indonesia, because as one would expect, if a convergence theory is true, um, it should be a downward sloping curve. But these two countries seem to bounce back and forth. So, so if there's something special or, you know, or something happened with these two countries during the period of your study, that's the first question. And the second question is more policy oriented, where um, you know, give, given you know, the study you've, you've done. Um, if you look at the middle-income countries in, in in Asia, you know, what would you think you know the policy prescription should be? I mean, do you do you believe that um, we should do nothing because there's going to be some sort of convergence, or do you believe that it's a middle-income trap that we could be in, um, or maybe you know we should also do some of the policies to counter the temporary um, effects of the of the um, global financial crisis? Thank you. Um, again, uh, um, I think the interesting uh, countries, the Philippines uh, uh, and Malaysia, Indonesia, to some extent, but not not really. Yeah, I didn't put the years of uh, of uh, in in uh, three three dots, but the um, those which uh, go um, uh, up in the growth rate um, uh, is um, sort of. A, Straight line up, uh, or the you know moving from right low right to up left like Philippines in the first point and second point, and um, I think Myanmar is another one. But that that's more policy, I think, political change, and um, uh, that that is a sort of big push to uh, bring up the uh, 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 growth rate. Uh, without change in the income level, so um, uh, that is an um, uh, interesting case. And, and uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, yeah, yes, uh, there are a change in growth rate, but the, I, I would say it's more more like uh, more like a uh, uh, convergence line. Uh, policy pre prescription again. Um, um, I think the. From low income to middle income, you need to have those um, uh, political stability and um, uh, getting infrastructure rights uh, to invite um, uh, foreign direct investment and so on. From middle income to high income, I would say, uh, I repeat uh, that uh, it's the innovation, more of the innovation and uh, technology uh, uh, story. And, but again, this, this is more uh, of my thinking rather than uh, based on the, based on the uh, rigorous um, uh, empirical study. Okay. More young people? <laughs> Younger. <laughs> okay, well, if not, then uh, let's give a big hand to Professor Ito for a very interesting seminar. So can I ask also here to give a little momentum of your visit?
you for the time. Thank you. 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 Thank you.